Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending this webinar. I am uh, Professor Daniel Zizzo. I'm the Academic Dean and Head of School of Economics here at the University of Queensland. Uh, on behalf of the University of Queensland, I'd like to begin these proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet virtually today. We uh, pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Now, you will notice that we have closed captioning enabled to make this webinar more accessible to our viewers. If you would like to turn this on or off, you can do so by clicking the leave live transcripts button below and following the prompts. Okay, just let me just add a few words. We are at the end of close to two years of the COVID-19 pandemic. And what two years have they been? Now, many organizations do long-term planning for highly disruptive incidents. Uh, you know, thinking about what would happen, thinking about risks, think about scenario planning. But I can't imagine many organizations having been ready for something like what has happened over the last two years. And there is more. For as the pandemic becomes an endemic, the question that we need to ask now is how the shocks caused to the way we work, to the way we study, to the way we travel, to the way we supply goods around the world, to the way that microeconomic policies have been run over the last couple of years and the implication this may have in the long term, to mention just a few dimensions, how all of these shocks and more are going to translate into long-term impacts. In a nutshell, the world is unlikely to go back to how it was, and this clearly offers challenges as well as opportunities. And this is really what this webinar about the economics of living with COVID is, is about, about looking at this, at this new age of, of living with, with COVID as an endemic, and living with the change and the changes that the pandemic has brought upon us or has accelerated upon us. Now, Professor Alicia Rambaldi from the School of Economics in University of Queensland will now introduce the speakers and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Welcome to today's edition of the UQ Economist Thought Leadership Series, where we explore living with COVID. I'm Alisa Rambaldi, and I will be chairing this session. I'm joined by a great panel. Our first speaker is John Quiggin. Uh, he's a professor of economics at the University of Queensland. He's a prominent research economist and commentator on Australian and international economic policy. He has produced over 2,000 publications, including seven books and over 250 referee journal articles in fields, including decision theory, environmental economics, and industrial organization. And as most of you would know, he's a very active contributor to Australian public debate in a wide range of traditional and social media. Our second speaker is Daniel Wood. She is the CEO of Grattan Institute and also leads Grattan's budget and government program. And she has published extensively on economic reform priorities, budgets, tax reform, generational inequality, and reforming political institutions. Daniel uh, previously worked at the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, uh, near economic consulting, and the Productivity Commission. Uh, she holds an honors degree in economics from the University of Adelaide and two master's degree, one in economics and one in competition law from the University of Melbourne. She's also the current president of the Economic Society and was the co-founder co and first chair of the Women in Economics Network. Uh, she's a member of the Parliamentary Budget Office, expert 
Advisory Committee, the Commonwealth Bank CEO Coun uh, Advisory Council, and the PwC Future of Work. And our third speaker is Dr. Stephen Hamilton, Assistant Professor of Economics at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. Uh, he's also a visiting fellow at the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at the Australian National University and a faculty affiliate at the Institute for International Economic Policy at George Washington University. Uh, Stephen's primary area of research is public finance, where he studies the effects of taxes on behavior with a view to designing very tax policy. Uh, Stephen has made significant contributions to small business support policies during this COVID pandemic crisis. And uh, he's authored um, a major small business support policy proposal for the Hamilton Project at the Brookings Institution and provided extensive commentary in the US and Australia on wage subsidies and other business support measures. Uh, Stephen has published many opinion pieces in major outlets like the Washington Post, the Australian Financial Review, and the age, just among many others, and also provided very extensive economic commentary to um, outlets such as the New York Times, the LA Times, the Sydney Morning Herald, and the Australian, just to name a few. He is a former economist at the Australian Treasury, uh, where he worked on the federal budget and reviews of climate change policy and flood insurance. He holds a PhD and MA in economics from the University of Michigan, and a Bachelor of Economics with first class honors and a Bachelor of Business Management from the University of Queens. Today's session will involve 10 minutes presentations from each of our speakers, and then that will be followed by 20 minutes Q&A session. We ask you that you please use your um, uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to place your questions, and we will uh, return to them as uh, during the Q&A time. So let me just uh, set the scene a little bit. Living with COVID, which is our theme today, has become a commonly used expression, which is used by politicians and health officials, not only in Australia, but also around the world. So in this session, we consider a number of aspects around this concept. So is living with COVID a problematic concept, given that those countries that have tried need to, needed to go back and reimpose restrictions? John is going to tackle this aspect. We then move to the impact of COVID on labor markets with our second speaker. So Daniel is going to cover um, a few things. Um, the concept of the great resignation. This is a term meaning that employees have voluntarily resigned from their jobs in mass. And uh, then she will move to the implications of hybrid work. And finally, she'll turn her attention to migration and have we missed a real opportunity to change policy. Our third speaker considered vaccines. The rapid development of vaccines against COVID-19 has truly changed the outlook for the world economy over the last 12 months. So Stephen will consider what have we learned, what still don't, we still don't know, and what the future might hold. So now I'm going to turn to our first speaker, John Quigan. So over to you, to you uh, John. Thanks, Alicia, and, and thanks, uh, Daniel, for the introduction. I'll share my screen now. So, um, anytime you deal with anything to do with uh, COVID, you've got the um, uh, risk that uh, events are going to move very rapidly and, and uh, prove your carefully prepared analysis wrong. Um, uh, that's happened to me certainly quite a few times. Uh, What's happened in the last few days is uh, the reverse, but maybe even worse. I uh, uh, insisted when we uh, proposed this title, we should have a question mark after living with COVID. That is, rather than accepting the idea, we should ask whether it is indeed feasible. Uh, of course, our policymakers in Australia have moved uh, rapidly ahead with uh, measures based on the assumption of living with COVID, uh, most rapidly in New South Wales. Uh, when I I uh, started writing my slides, New South Wales was running about 250 cases a day when I uh, sent them in to uh, I'd be ready for this at, at 500 a day, and today's number is 1300, and the health minister talking 25,000. So what that says, I think, is that uh, the risk that uh, uh, the risk that a policy of living with COVID will prove unsustainable is very great indeed. So it's, it's the catchphrase of the day. Uh, we've been talking about it for quite a while. 
Uh, but it's unclear what it means. Obviously, in some sense, we've been living with COVID uh, for the last two years. Uh, of course, not all of us managing to live. Uh, uh, millions of people have indeed died with COVID. Uh, so does a notion of living with COVID make sense? Uh, what's going to happen uh, in a period of policy where we are indeed, uh, indeed thinking about uh, attempting to live with COVID? Well, first, let's just recapitulate the history of the pandemic. Um, we saw it first, uh, at least, emerge late in 2019, just about two years ago in Wuhan in China. Uh, it spread quite rapidly to the US and Europe. We had the first wave, which was met with very widespread lockdowns and restrictions. Uh, they were relaxed. Uh, the pandemic was uh, then spread uh, all over the world, beyond the places that had first been affected. And what we've seen since then is many waves of uh, relaxation, increasing infection and restriction. Uh, and so um, uh, that's, uh, that was, of course, has been significantly affected by the arrival of vaccines, uh, roughly speaking, at the beginning of 2020, uh, which, uh, of 2021 rather, uh, which Stephen will talk about. So let's, let's just remind ourselves, those who haven't come across this, uh, this concept or haven't, I think most people have seen it at one time or another, but uh, its implications are perhaps not fully appreciated. We need to think about the reproduction rate. That is the average number of new cases generated by an existing case during the infectious period. So um, uh, R0 is the rate in a population with no previous exposure and no protection uh, through vaccination. It depends both on the characteristics of the virus and on how people naturally interact. Uh, Arnold has to be greater than one for the disease to spread. Uh, what we've seen in the course of the, of the course of the pandemic is the emergence of successive variants with higher R0 rates, higher uh, transmissibility. And uh, the Omicron variant that has just emerged, uh, of course, as Bede and all others. Then R is the actual rate at any given time. It depends on the number of immune to vaccination or previous infection and on what kind of changes we make in the way in which we interact. Uh, so, um, uh, so the crucial point is uh, uh, that this is a process, this kind of process is one which economists are familiar with in all sorts of ways, uh, exponential growth or contraction. So um, examples include compound interest, populations, and of course, the spread of pandemics. And so what we have is, is a striking result that um, uh, depending on whether this number R is greater than one or less than one, uh, exponential processes either grow without bound uh, growing arbitrarily large or approach zero. Uh, they can be stable only if R is exactly equal to one or if R fluctuates around one. And so that's, um, uh, that's also, of course, true of an investment. If it's, if it's making a positive return and you have a compound, it will grow. If it's losing money, it will shrink to zero. Uh, only at the special case of, uh, of money in the bank with zero inflation, uh, or money, money under the mattress with zero inflation stays at one. And uh, this sort of doesn't seem to be uh, really recognised. Everybody understands at some level, but uh, doesn't seem to be understood in terms of the implications uh, it has for public policy. And what we see rather is a rather snarky cartoon in the style of XKCD, but not uh, XKCD, uh, which shows how... Um, how we see this exponential process. So for somebody with a scientific or mathematical training, this is an exponential curve uh, uh, from beginning to end, but um, it's easy to, easy to take the impression that um, with a bit of fluctuation around this, that at this lower level, everything is, uh, we can even imagine that the uh, curve is declining. That was the case, say, uh, in Britain after, uh, shortly after Freedom Day uh, there in, in June, uh, when cases were in fact starting to rise, there was nonetheless uh, regular good news, which was seen as going down. Then a period when things are under control, when you sort of imagine linear growth, and then finally uh, uh, things start going out of control and we, we have a panic. Uh, but the exponential growth in this process hasn't changed at any point. So what does living with COVID mean? Uh, well, I think, as far as I can tell, just you know, since, since it's really defined, uh, what people have in mind is that we can keep R near one at some acceptable level in infection, hospitalisation and death. Uh, now, uh, I think a lot of the people 
using the phrase, imagine that we can find a policy which has these properties, that, that uh, we can fix the policy, it will keep RNA1, and then we can just go about our business. But in fact, uh, what we see is what it means in reality is that we're going to relax restrictions when rates fall, rates fall below the acceptable levels and then tighten them again when rates rise and continue doing that through wave after wave. Uh, when we started talking about living with COVID in Australia, uh, Denmark was the prime example. There were a lot of uh, very favourable articles about Denmark simply based on the fact they'd announced the policy uh, without sort of waiting to see what actually happened. Uh, Denmark went along that flat part of the curve for a while, then things started rising, uh, they reimposed restrictions and of course are tightening up even further with Omicron. And very similar stories in Singapore. Uh, the UK has just passed through Parliament a package of restrictions over the objections of a large group of uh, backbenchers, uh, some on both sides. Uh, so what we've seen is a series of, of announcements that we're going to live with COVID combined with a fairly substantial, uh, drastic removal of most restrictions, followed by the reimposition of those restrictions uh, as cases begin to rise. Well, that's, uh, that's the, um, uh, why I've been so sceptical about this notion of living with COVID, the notion that what we do is pick an acceptable rate and try and keep the, uh, keep the number near that rate. In my view, if we're going to have a stable rate, uh, zero would be the best one or as near to zero as we can get. So what's the alternative? Well, let's suppose, which I think is reasonable, that we can't continue with border closures and that we have to hope that uh, the advent of vaccines means that we can So, um, oh, sorry, I'll just go back. So, infections, we want therefore policies that will keep R less than one. What that means is each new infection, rather than forming the basis of an steadily expanding uh, outbreak, uh, gradually fades away to zero. That of course is what Queensland managed um, repeatedly during the last four or five months. Uh, a few cases would show up, R would fall to, uh, but, but they would fizzle out uh, with uh, uh, moderate restrictions and uh, we got back to zero quite a few times. Uh, that suggests that we're in a relatively favourable state, but of course, uh, with borders open, we're going to have a great many more infections arriving. Uh, what that implies, uh, contrary to I think at least some analysis is what we need is more stringent policies uh, rather than less. Of course, uh, we've been relatively well off in having uh, very few restrictions. Uh, I think if we're going to keep R less than one in the presence of regular arrivals in a micron, uh, that means either stringent vaccine mandates, uh, restricting the access of the unvaccinated to virtually all public activities, or else as Austria has just, just moved mandatory vaccination, uh, continuing with work from home as a preferred or at least available choice, giving up the idea that we should all get back to our offices uh, for those of people who have the choice, uh, continued mask wearing in high risk settings and testing both pre-arrival and post-arrival uh, with quarantine for positive post-arrival tests. So those are the kind of policies I think we need uh, if we are going to live with COVID in the sense of uh, accepting that we can't maintain zero with uh, uh, regular arrivals of people from high risk uh, high risk uh, sources, uh, but if we don't want to have the kind of catastrophic outbreak uh, we we're already seeing in New South Wales. So um, uh, COVID is going to be with us for a long time to come. Uh, in that sense, living with COVID isn't a choice, but a fact. Nonetheless, the idea of living with COVID as it has been put forward in Australian public policy, in my view, is misconceived. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I'm going to sort of totally uh, change tack now. Uh, and if you can just let me know when you can see the slides. Um, and I am kind of interested in this idea of um, COVID as a big disruption and, and what will be the kind of um, effects that reverberate through other parts of the economy. And I'm going to particularly focus on labour markets because I think that's an area where we'll be seeing um, the effects for a long time to come. Um, so as Alicia said, uh, I'm going to kind of ask the question, the great resignation, what, what is it? And is it actually happening in Australia? 
Uh, I want to talk about the rise of hybrid work, which absolutely is happening, uh, and I think will we'll have some pretty significant long-term implications. And then I'll come to the question of, of migration, and obviously another major disruption from COVID has been the shutting of, of the international borders, as, as John said, and there's a lot of debate about um, what we should do, uh, not on the other side, but as, as we, uh, we are opening borders and, and, and how we should um, shift our migration program, if at all. Um, so the Great Resignation, uh, no doubt you've seen the newspaper headlines because they are everywhere. Um, there is um, some kind of evidence base behind it in that there is sort of surveys floating around that suggests that a lot of Australians um, would like to change their job uh, within the next year or so. Some pretty um, eye-watering numbers there suggesting 40% um, would like to change. Uh, but we're not seeing it in the sort of contemporaneous data yet. And certainly actually the proportion of Australians changing jobs. Um, and the last read that we had uh, is the, the lowest level since the ABS started asking the question. Um, the term itself came from the United States where there is a, a spike up in the quit rate and it's occurring across the economy, but particularly sort of disproportionately focused in some sectors like manufacturing. Um, you can probably get a sense from the chart, um, part of what is going on is just a catch up effect. Uh, we had a period through 2020 and lockdowns uh, where people weren't voluntarily um, leaving their employers. Um, so we would certainly expect to, to see a bit of catch up, uh, but it, it seems to be more than that. Uh, and there's a, sort of a growing debate and, and sort of growing literature around what's going on. Um, some arguments that it is um, generosity of income supports has enabled people to leave crap jobs. Um, some people suggesting that COVID has um, caused people to reconsider um, their priorities. Uh, and, and are therefore um, taking the opportunity um, either to exit the labour force altogether or, or to, to switch where they're working. Um, so I think there is a, a question given, we haven't seen it in Australia yet. Um, is it that people are just feeling disillusioned but they're not actually going to switch and they, they realise the grass isn't always greener? Um, or are we gonna see more of this um, flowing through in the, the new year? Um, I suspect uh, it's more of the latter. Uh, it was certainly we would expect to see a catch-up effect after people have been sort of tied to their employers for the best part of 18 months through COVID. Um, there's also, uh, you know, very early signs maybe in this kind of more decomposed data about people who are leaving jobs and why. Um, more are now leaving because they, they voluntarily um, wanted a change or they wanted a better job, which is kind of the, the hallmark of the great resignation. Um, and frankly, if we saw a bit of increase in churn, it would be a good thing. Um, so, you know, Treasury have done some work that suggests the very low rates of job churn in the pre-COVID world um, were contributing to, to low wages growth. Um, when people leave a job, they will generally get a, a pay rise, which is good for their wages growth, but also good for wages growth across the economy. Um, so if we do want to see wages moving again, um, some degree of churn will be really necessary to, to make that happen. Um, coming to hybrid work now, and I, I mean, I find this so fascinating because it has just been a large scale um, forced experiment onto Australian businesses and, and workers. Um, so Australia in the world pre-COVID, less than 10% of people um, worked from home even some of the time. Uh, in the last two years, that, that number's been up around 40%. So obviously there's a whole lot of jobs that cannot be done at home, uh, but for, for offices-based jobs, um, turns out we, we can do this. Um, you know, why wouldn't business do it in the absence of COVID? Uh, I, I really like this quote. I think it's, um, he's the JP Morgan CEO. Anyway, one of the investment bank CEOs. Um, you know, business just wouldn't have taken the risk of doing this um, on, on scale because no one was sure whether it would work. Uh, but now we have done it. Um, what we see is um, employees are really kind of um, shifting their preference set. So um, there's a ton of different survey evidence, all of which suggests that uh, amongst employees that can work from home, um, a majority have a preference for hybrid work and particularly two to three days a week in the office, two to three days at home is the most common choice. Uh, and the reason they give is, I mean, there's, there's many reasons, uh, but the number one seems to be avoiding the commute. Uh, and it makes sense. Commuting is, is really costly. Um, so the opportunity cost of time uh, is high, particularly for um, in cities like Sydney or Melbourne where average commutes are longer. Um, there's also additional costs in terms of transportation costs. And if you can avoid that some of the time, then that's a good thing. Um, so some interesting US data about what people are actually doing with that extra time that they're freeing up from the commute. Um, 
Some of it is going back to the employer. Uh, they're, they're working a bit more, about a third of it is going flowing back to employers. Uh, and the rest is just doing stuff that um, gives them value. Um, so whether that's going and getting a second job and earning more income, um, you know, children, household chores or, or leisure, uh, employees are getting a dividend from this. Um, the big concern has always been what will it mean for productivity? Uh, and I can bet you anything if you did the survey two years ago, um, employers would have been extremely sceptical about productivity. Um, you know, this is only perceptions and there is issues and, and how this shifts over time, as I'm going to talk about. But, you know, I think it is interesting that for both employers and employees, the most common um, view of it is that productivity is remind about the same. Um, so where does this leave us? So now we're in this very... Um, strange world I think where we're kind of working towards a new equilibrium um, with the the caveat of everything that John has just said that um, you know maybe as, as we go through more waves uh, this process will get set back but um, really what we're doing I think is negotiating towards a new normal. Um, for most businesses I think there are sizable benefits of face-to-face -face contact um, for culture, for those kind of water cooler conversations um, for um, onboarding new employees. Um, so, you know, the idea of fully remote work, I think, is not attractive for many businesses. There are some types of businesses where um, the benefits are just so big. So um, firms, particularly where you want to tap into a global talent pool. Um, so we see some of the tech firms going down this route. Uh, other businesses where just the costs of being remote are, are very small. Um, so things like telemarketing, where they just don't do collaboration with your colleagues, it's kind of easy to monitor output. Um, so they've gone fully remote. But I think for most other workplaces, they will settle in this kind of hybrid world. Uh, and, you know, for all the employers that may want to get people back to work full time, um, employees are going to demand this. Um, so, you know, in the US where they ask people what they, um, what kind of wage um, premium they would be willing to pay or wage cap they would take um, if they were in a in an employer that didn't offer hybrid it's about it's worth about seven percent of pay to employees um, so this will form part of people's decision making about which um, which jobs they take going forward um, so employers I think will, will have to find a way to offer this um, and, and it's probably in their longer term interest to do so um, I'm just going to skip over um, the kind of broader effects, but I think it's fair to say that if um, hybrid becomes the norm, there is going to be all sorts of flow on effects um, for transportation patterns, for where we choose to live. Um, so I think it's um, one of those ones that has kind of quite significant economic reverberations. Uh, but just so I can squeeze it in, I also want to talk about migration uh, because this was an extraordinary shock and Australia has historically run a pretty... Um, large migration program by um, developed country standards uh, and essentially it went to, to zero overnight. In fact, we, um, we had um, net outwards migration um, for the first time. Um, and there's a lot of debate about what we should do about that as borders reopen. Um, Dominic Perrottet, New South Wales Premier, has said, um, you know, not only should we go back to pre-COVID levels, uh, but we should try and catch up on the, the migration that was lost during the pandemic. Um, not government policy, but certainly sort of government whispers to the media and as, as well as from the opposition, um, maybe we should go slow on, on reopening, um, not because of health risks, but because um, we want to create um, some wage pressure in the economy. Um, so I think it is worth revisiting um, the literature on migration. Um, and, and wage effects. Um, so it's, it's pretty clear from both the theoretical and empirical literature internationally and in Australia that um, overall migration doesn't have a downward impact on, on wages. And that's because um, migrants add to the demand for labour as well as the supply. They buy things when they're here, they use services. Um, there are, however, some distributional effects. Um, and if you have migration concentrated in particular segments of the economy, um, you may see um, downward wage pressure on those that have um, substitutable skills. Uh, on the flip side, people with complementary skills um, would see their wages go in the other direction. Uh, so I think what the, the dynamic that's been going on here, and we're hearing a lot of um, sectors that were very reliant on, on temporary migrants in particular, complaining about staff shortages, so things like um, agriculture, so fruit picking, um, hospitality, um, shortages, uh, particularly in sectors where there's uh, limited barriers to entry or limited training required, 
um, are only shortages at current wages. <laughs> um, and I think uh, we're seeing these firms that are unwilling to, to, to meet the market and shift the permanent wage up uh, because they are anticipating that, that borders are going to reopen and that they'll be able to rely on that supply of labour again. But, um, you know, I think we have really missed an opportunity here to talk about um, not just the size of the intake, but the composition of the intake. So we run um, a large skilled migration program in Australia. It is done uh, on the basis of the economic benefits. Um, they are very real. Um, there are spillover benefits, um, particularly for, for more skilled arrivals uh, in terms of um, the, the knowledge that they bring in, the know-how. Um, there's also very clear fiscal benefits, um, particularly from, from younger and, and more skilled um, arrivals. They, they pay a lot more in tax revenue than they end up taking out in, in services, which is um, very attractive to governments. But um, not all visa categories are equal here. Um, so if we look across the permanent skilled um, migrant visas, the employer-sponsored visas, the point-sponsored visas are very good at, at selecting um, uh, migrants that end up being, um, you know, very high earners compared to the um, Australian incumbent population. Uh, on the other hand, there are some classes of visa, particularly investor visas, um, where the economic outcomes are very poor. And essentially, they've become a way of people buying visas. They will need to buy kind of small businesses in order to qualify for those visas. Uh, the rationale is supposed to be about attracting capital, but that's not something we really have a, a, an issue with at the moment. Um, the other very strange thing about our skilled um, migration intake is that we rely on these bureaucratic things called occupation lists. Um, you can only bring people in through the employer or point sponsored programs if um, your job is on the list. Um, and how do you get on the list? Essentially by, it looks like, by kind of lobbying government at some point or another and then lobbying to stay on. Uh, the lists bear no resemblance to the level of skill of the job or the ultimate income of the job. Um, so we've said while the borders were shut, this would have been the time to do this. Um, you know, wind back those investment visas, um, use the places for people on the um, visas that are really successful at, at selecting um, big economic contributors uh, and at the same time um, get rid of the occupation lists and apply a wage threshold. Uh, it's unfortunate that we didn't take the opportunity to do it when the screaming would have been <laughs> the lowest. Uh, that's not to say that it's, it can't be done uh, beyond this, uh, and we're certainly um, continuing to advocate that the government think about these kind of compositional questions because they're big and, and, and they matter a lot. Um, I am going to end it there and hand over to Steve. Uh, hang on, sorry, I'm just getting my screen organized. People can hear me, right? Yes, cool. Okay, good. And you can see me, right? <laughs> Is this a blank screen? No, good. I see. Yes, yes. Um, so I didn't have any slides because all of my, all of my, when I sat down and, and reflected on w w the, the sentence living with COVID question mark, I thought, yeah, well, I, I don't have any graphs, but I have a whole lot to say. So uh, I, I thought I would just talk to you for, for 10 minutes. Um, so I will, I'm just putting a timer so that I don't miss the time. Cool. Um, so yeah, so thanks for the great presentation so far. It's hard to come after that, um, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so I, I uh, you know, as as Daniel said, we've been going uh, through this pandemic now for almost two years. Uh, you know, if we can all take our minds back to Christmas uh, 2019, right, almost exactly at this time the virus was spreading through Wuhan, had almost certainly broken through to, to the rest of the world by that point, and this whole story began. Uh, it's almost inconceivable that it's been two years, but anyway, here we are. Uh, I started writing, I've written a, an enormous amount on COVID-19, uh, probably too much. Uh, it's been a huge distraction 
But but the two major focuses that I've had in writing about COVID were, was last year I wrote a lot about small business, and this year I wrote a lot about vaccines. Um, now there's an interesting question uh, as to what those two things have in common, uh, and 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 they seem un, unrelated. And indeed, I, I have no expertise in either of those questions. Right, I'm an economist. I study tax policy, and yet I've written a whole lot on small business and a whole lot on vaccines. Uh, the thing is, the thing that unites both of those issues, it, it certainly was the case uh, when I started writing in March 2020, and again, it was the case at the beginning of this year. These are two issues that I think conventional thinking was very badly wrong about, right? That, that sort of establishment viewpoint about policy on both small business and vaccine was very wrong. Uh, and then and the public conversation that, that surrounded those issues at the time was way off track, or at least that was my judgment. So in March 2020, February, March 2020, a lot of uh, establishment macroeconomists were advocating conventional fiscal stimulus measures that would work in a conventional recession. They were advocating, for example, widespread cash transfers to households. Uh, and they said that would be sufficient because we learned a lot from 2008 and we'll do that again. Uh, I looked at this and I thought, well, we're about to shut the economy down, <laughs> right? We're about to, this was in the US, but the same issue in Australia. We're about to shut the entire economy down. Uh, we're about to turn off the economy's plumbing. And so the entire economic mechanism of fiscal stimulus is about to stop, right? So just relying on a conventional measure, I think is, is not going to work. So one, one big issue with this is that uh, what would happen, I think, is uh, that the large shock to the economy would lead a lot of businesses to, to close, that they would detach from their employees, uh, and we would see a huge amount of business failures. And those two things, the detaching of businesses from their employees and the large number of business failures, I was very worried would, would cause significant, not only significant economic contraction, during the, the pandemic, but, but a, a significant scarring beyond the pandemic. So I was advocating at the time very aggressively for wage subsidies and small business supports against the kind of grain, right? Uh, I think in hindsight, that turns out to have been the right approach, uh, but you know, the time will tell. Uh, at the start of 2020, at the start of at 2021, this year, uh, there was a lot of people who were very complacent about the vaccine rollout. Right. So in about mid-December 2020, I looked at this vaccine rollout and I thought, this seems really weird that Australia looks to be at least three months behind the rest of the world. We haven't even approved the vaccine. Uh, are, we, are we being complacent? Like what is happening? And, 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 and widespread commentary, widespread sort of expert commentary through January, February and beyond was was very complacent in terms of the urgency of the vaccine rollout. So I looked at that and I thought, this doesn't seem right, right? Um, Australia's put a lot of its eggs in one basket. The, the vaccine rollout looks to be in trouble. And so I started writing. One thing that I think we've learned from the pandemic uh, is the limits of expertise. So I, so I, I, I you know, you, you think of the pandemic as, as, as listen to the experts, right? That that's been the kind of mantra we've taken. But in very many areas, conventional expertise, I think has been found wanting. So it was public health experts, for example, who were telling us uh, in early uh, 2020 not to wear masks, right? Uh, it was public health experts this year, all the way through this year, who were telling us not to use rapid tests, for example. Uh, there was a lot of public experts, tell, public health experts telling me that uh, the vaccine rollout uh, having having AstraZeneca as the as the as the choice was a good choice, and that we didn't need uh, redundancy. So I think one big lesson of the pandemic is expertise isn't enough, right? So we shouldn't blindly follow experts. Uh, we shouldn't assume because someone has some conventional expertise that they can solve complex problems with a huge degree of uncertainty and in a space that we haven't been in before, right? So I think that's a big lesson to take away, right? We need to be skeptical and be be and consider carefully uh, how to solve these problems. Um, now, that the, the other thing that I think we've learned is uh, 
we've done a terrible job, I would argue, and this is why I want to talk about vaccines. We've mostly done a terrible job at favoring low cost, high benefit options in dealing with the pandemic versus high cost, low benefit options, right? In all sorts of, um, in all sorts of uh, areas, we've, we've selected the bad options, right? We've, we've, we've reached for the, the high hanging fruit before we've, we've, we've taken the low hanging fruit. Uh, and as an economist, right, that's very concerning <laughs> because our kind of entire premise as, as, as policy uh, people is to try and think of uh, solutions to policy that favor the, that low hanging fruit. Um, I think masks are a great example, right? We, we, we were way too slow on masks in terms of a very low cost option that has a, a pretty significant benefit in terms of reducing spread. Uh, rapid test, again, I think is a very good, good, good thing here. Like rapid tests, very cheap, very re relatively effective, extremely fast, and yet only recently became legal in Australia. Which, are, which is a, just a tremendous failure that we, that, we, we, that we kept that off the table. Um, and in, in various respects, a lot of these crazy decisions, I think are continuing, right? We continue to choose high cost options before low cost ones. Um, and, and, and somehow we haven't, we haven't learned that, that lesson. I think the vaccine rollout is the primary example of this, right? I think that what we learned is that, you know, governments with the rollout have a, had a really hard time dealing with uncertainty, they had a hard time in understanding risk, they had a hard time in getting out of the kind of penny-pinching mindset that, that they usually have in, in conventionally trying to solve policy problems. Uh, and that combined into a, 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 a significant failure in terms of the vaccine rollout that I continue to believe is one of the biggest um, catastrophes in, in Australian policy history. Um, if we add, if we, if we think of the human lives that were lost, and if we think of the uh, the dollars that it cost us in terms of lost economic output, uh, it is very, very significant. Um, and I think we need to think carefully about what led to that, that failure. Um, the other, on the other hand, I think what we were good at is the government was very good at delivering the services, right? So I think in general, the hospital system has been very well, uh, has been run very well through the pandemic. Uh, you know, in all sorts of respects, we've been very good at administering policy. So the actual rollout, once we got the vaccines, ran incredibly smoothly and we were able to roll those vaccines out as fast as any, any other country in the world, right? And we were able to achieve a very high level of coverage. So, you know, there are, there, we, we, I think we've exposed what our governments are good at and not so good at um, through, through the pandemic and through the vaccine rollout. Um, uh, two more lessons I kind of want to flick to. Uh, one, um, I think our economy has been incredibly resilient through the pandemic, and I think that's very striking. I suspect Danielle and John will agree with that. Um, but that required significant fiscal support. So if we have the fiscal support that we need, our economy is incredibly resilient and can bounce back very quickly. Uh, and, and, and we've seen an incredible recovery in the labor market. And I suspect through the second wave, we'll see another pretty rapid recovery. But on the other hand, I think other variables, social variables, other parts of our life, I think we are, we are, we are unlikely to change, right? So there's a whole range of uh, things that I think people are going to take away from this pandemic, yes, but I think that the permanent changes that it makes to our life, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical that those will be uh, too dramatic. I think in many areas, uh, we'll revert to the mean, we'll go back to the way things were um, before the pandemic. I'm, I'm a kind of skeptic on that, on that basis. So the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about in the, in the couple of minutes I have left um, is, is sort of where to from here, like where are we going now that we've reflected on what we, we did well and not, did, not, did not do well. Um, the first is, I, I totally agree with John's model of, of, the, of, the, of the, the virus going forward, and I think vaccines are essential to John's story, and I, I agree with all of his recommendations. Um, my guess is we'll fluctuate around one, right? So cases will come down and they'll go up and they'll come down, right? And I think we'll have periods of surging and we'll have periods of, of, the, of the cases going down. What's essential is maintaining vaccines and including boosters that we have now to try and reduce those fluctuations as much as we can. And I think the, the, the vaccine coverage that we have achieved is remarkable. And that driving that vaccine coverage, continuing to drive that protection via boosters will allow those fluctuations to be significantly smaller 
than they otherwise uh, otherwise would have been. Um, and I think that's kind of the future model that we'll have. We're going to kind of muddle through. Uh, we have to figure out the timing of boosters, the timing of, of third and subsequent doses. We have to figure out what to do with uh, variants and how we'll update those boosters for new variants. All policy questions that we haven't dealt with, right? We're, we're talking about bringing boosters forward, but no one's talking about what happens with fourth doses or with boosters for new variants. So we're going to have to figure out Living with COVID is going to be significantly about figuring out what that plan is for a permanent vaccine supply going into the future. Um, what, what, what are the questions I have standing here now thinking about the future? You know, I have, I have all sorts of questions. I think we, we, a key unknown thing is, is, the, is the mutation space of the virus, the degree to which the virus will mutate and escape our vaccine protection. And that's going to really be critical to how we respond, right? And we need to make sure that we build our systems to be resilient to that possibility. And we're seeing some of that with Omicron. Um, you know, another one is, you know, are we going to take lessons away or are we going to keep making the same mistake? So I think back to rapid testing, I think we continue not to rely on rapid testing enough, right? To, to leave Queensland and come back, you need a PCR test. It takes a long time, it's expensive. Uh, and and that's what we're relying on. We're continuing not to rely on rapid testing, which I think is a is a big mistake that we haven't learned. Uh, I, I see the uh, government this week announced a new mRNA uh, manufacturing facility in Victoria, which is great, but it's not going to be up and running for two years. So we, we we didn't get a manufacturing facility up and running early in the pandemic. We waited two years, and even now it's still going to be another two years before it starts producing vaccines. So. You know, that again seems to be an instance of us making kind of the same mistakes again, being dragging the chain and not being urgent enough in how we, we manage the pandemic. So, you know, for me, that's the big unknown question. Are we going to take lessons away from what we've done well and done poorly during the pandemic to date in order to better live with COVID on a sustainable basis going forward? So I will get back to Alicia, who I think is going to run a QA. Thank you very much to the three of you. And uh, this is really uh, open up for uh, some really good uh, q and I already have a few. So let me start with Martin. Um, the question is, while most companies offer hybrid work now, what trend do you see with regards to the appetite of employers to hire people far outside corporate office locations? That is, suppose they are in Brisbane, in Sydney, would they hire somebody in Adelaide or uh, uh, Brisbane? Uh, is this trend going to change? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So I look, I think um, it makes it more likely they will do that. Um, so my understanding is most employers still think face-to-face -face is important. Um, so I, I don't think it's just going to be open slather um, you know, hire, you know, work anywhere you want. Um, I, I just don't think that's the way forward for most employers. Um, that said, it's clearly reduced the cost of, of um, hiring people remotely if for a particular reason you think they are a good fit and you want to do that. Uh, I suspect it's going to be more likely to be the sort of firms where they're willing to kind of pay for people to, to travel and do face-to-face -face occasionally. Um, so I, I suspect we will see more of this, but I don't think it's going to be the kind of widespread norm, the Atlassian model, work anywhere in the world. Um, I don't I don't think that's going to become um, the kind of mainstream for most businesses. John? Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, a crucial issue is going to be what happens to, to housing costs. I think, um, yeah, looking at Cynthia Melbourne, uh, I think um, employers may well find, uh, particularly if they want to hire people from interstate, that, the cost, the cost of moving is so great that, that they'll be forced, they'll be forced to accept people staying where they are. So I think uh, uh, any period when we have a, a tight labour market in Sydney and Melbourne, uh, and employers want to hire, want to hire on a broader market, I think they're going to be stuck with saying, uh, "Look, uh, I'm just not willing to move given the costs of living in those places." Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just add that. Uh, I'll, I'll reiterate what I said before, which is I'm a skeptic that things will change at all. Uh, maybe they'll change a little bit at the margin, but I think uh, at the end of the day, bosses like to see their, their employees, right? They want to see them. They, want, they don't trust them. Mm. <laughs> they don't think when they're at home, they're going to be productive. They want to see them in the office. 
uh, they want to be able to meet face to face. So, you know, yes, there may be a marginal change, but I think the vast majority of people within, say, three years will kind of go back to the way things were before. Uh, I, I, well, I don't know. I suspect in yeah. Yeah. cities where we've done this a lot, people are just not going to go back. I mean, yeah. I just, I do yeah. not know anyone that is envisaging going back into yeah. work full time. It's just, I think yeah. that, that we've done it long enough that it's just um, people's actual yeah. preference set has has permanently shifted and employers just won't be able to demand it. I, I mean, I think bosses love the idea until back to pay. I think all the people, yeah, there's no doubt that, um, there's no doubt that especially mid-level managers are going to be are really keen on it because they're ultimately not, yeah, they're typically not paying the bills. And, and of course, um, their own function is, is the most vulnerable in the, in the hybrid uh, in the hybrid world. But I think whoever is actually paying the payroll, when they say, well, you know, this person in Adelaide or an equally good person in Sydney and pay them 20, 20, 30, 40% more, um, you know, that, that logic is going to be pretty, uh, it's going to be pretty compelling. But at the moment, what all the bosses have said is, come back in, we're not going to pay you, you know, we're not going to compensate you for coming back in. You know, you've had your fun and that's the end of it. I think that works for existing workers, but not, for, not so much for new ones. Another way to flip that around, just adding back in, is if, if that's true, like if, if you if Danielle and John's hunch is true that it may be a significant, that has massive implications mm. for <laughs> like lots and lots of things, right? Massive Indeed. implications. Yep. Yeah. And this is why I think it's so interesting because it's yeah, it's got its implications for yeah. you know where people are going to choose to live, for C B D business viability, like all sorts of things. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to hang off this. The major implications yeah. here is on capital assets. Many, many people are yes. talking about that. Uh, yep. Investment in superannuations uh, um, are heavily, <laughs> when we talk about real estate, we talk about commercial. And, and this actually has a lot of uh, implications for returns. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of huge implications from this. So thank you for that. I'm going to move. We can come back to this if time uh, permits, because it's, an, it's a fascinating <laughs> um, uh, area. But uh, Flavio now asks, um, is there an economic case for nationally mandated vaccination? Uh, so in my view, overwhelmingly, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, the only question is, you know, I'm yeah, uh, a liberal as far as I'm concerned. As long as people are willing to accept the restrictions we all accepted during the lockdown, I'm perfectly happy for them to stay home and not get vaccinated. But I think, uh, I think, yeah, the, the policy that New South Wales has adopted is both catastrophic in anticipation, and of course, uh, they haven't even looked ahead to the question. Yeah, you know, they're talking about boosters. We currently have zero boosters. And without a mandate, New South Wales is never going to get to eighty percent, ninety percent booster rates. Uh, and yet, just as the need for boosters has become more obviously urgent, uh, they've decided to remove the mandate. So I think I think this is a policy which, in my view, has a shelf life of no more than a month or two. Uh, but in the meantime, immense damage is going to be done. Yeah, so I think the, um, if we mean mandate in terms of do I require vaccination status to go into um, any kind of risky setting, like a restaurant or a theatre or, I mean... Or other very people. Yeah, so I look, I fully support that. Um, if it was a question of, you know, do we require every single Australian to to get a jab, no excuses? Um, you know, like obviously in a very narrow economic sense, that would, that would that? still <laughs> say up. But yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think there's, yeah, I mean, I think there's I mean, some yeah, pretty I think significant Austria's, Austria's questions. Done it. Yeah. Austria's I mean, done it and succeeding. So I think, I think uh, the idea that, the idea that it, I mean, I think, you can avoid it in the US context by having you know, literally millions of deaths. Um, but I think, I think we'll see something very close to it. But what we know is that the, um, with just persuasion plus mm. the requirement to, to yeah. go into mm. settings, that, that's been enough. We've yeah. been able to achieve yeah, a very I high think. rate and I would prefer to, to leave the settings yes. there. I'm, I'm happy with that view. So, so I, I tell you one thing, one thing uh, Scott Morrison was dead right about and I was dead wrong about. <laughs> Oh, there's no, I promise that yeah. this is very Wow, well, I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> is I did not expect us to get to like as high a vaccination rate as we did. I oh, did not we expect right. it. <laughs> um, I did not expect 95. Like it's it's extraordinary. Mm. And, and 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 two things: people's willingness to go out, 
Um, you know, you think of it as an economist about externalities, you know, people aren't thinking about the spread, they're only thinking about themselves. But on the other hand, if people are irrationally afraid of the virus, <laughs> that actually works in the opposite direction than the externality, right? So I think uh, the, the, where we got to in the end with modest requirements, I think is staggering. Um, and I suspect, you know, my, my view would be we, we try and hit the same target, do whatever we need to do on policy just to hit the same level with boosters. And we just keep that up every year. And, and I think, you know, I don't know, John, about the, my, my thing is like if we get to 95 and there's 5% of people, like let them go. But, you know, um, but I'm, I'm not a negative Yeah. We won't get to ninety-five. Yeah, sure. Exactly, we won't get to ninety-five without, uh, you know, without uh, essentially requiring large categories of people. Yeah, you know, I mean, you get to ninety-seven seems to be you know, it, yes. whatever the culture, even in the US, if the mandate is imposed for work, you get ninety-seven yes. percent compliance. That seems to be the number. Uh, I think, um, I think, you know, that's going to, yeah, that's that's what, yeah, what we need essentially is if you work, brings you in contact with other people colleagues, co-workers, clients, or whatever, then the mandate should apply. Yeah. So if indeed you're a you know, libertarian computer programmer who sits in their basement, by all means. <laughs> the US. <laughs> and I think it's and I think it's politically at equilibrium. Like I think the political indeed. vast majority of Australians, the political system will just make mm. this happen probably. Yeah. And I think I think we'll see that New South Wales, you know, which has tried to break, yeah, has tried to break with the, that that policy will fail very fast, is my view. Thank you, everyone. I think we only have about like one minute uh, left. So, oh, just on time. So, Steve, how can we get better at making policy on the fly for complex yeah. issues? That's a good question. I mean, so I, I said what we did good and what we did bad, but I didn't say how to, <laughs> how to fix it. So I will tell you one thing, which is, um, you know, I think we have to have more capacity in our public sector. So mm. I, 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 I really do think that the public sector has badly diminished over time. Mm. Uh, and I think we have to seriously think about smart, creative ways to make, to build capacity in the public sector. I worked at Treasury. I had lots of issues with Treasury when I worked mm. there. And yet people told me that's a gold standard government department. If you worked in some other department, you'd be pulling the air out. So I think, uh, I think the health department screwed up big time on the vaccine rollout for various reasons. And I think we need to fix it, right? So I'd start with building more capacity, being creative about how to, you know, build a stronger, better, better funded, better paid public servants, yada, 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 do what we can to build capacity in the public service. I had a piece in the monthly called Dismembering Government, which essentially said the state we had in 1970 would have done a far better job of yeah. dealing with, with the pandemic in the state we have now, that we would have, we wouldn't have, yeah, the, the national government would have done quarantine rather than outsourcing at the states, would have been done publicly rather than mm -hmm. trying to mix and match with hotel quarantine and so forth. So I think, yeah, uh, I, I agree entirely that, yeah, what this says is, particularly at the national level, we just totally, totally lack, lack state, state capacity in the sense state of- State capacity, exactly. In the sense of the state as opposed to, you know, the state governments have state capacity in the national <laughs> government, uh, you know, particularly under this government, but more generally has just lost it. Can I very quickly add one as well? I think I think we do need to kind of go back and, and look at what we did and learn from it. Um, and, you know, when I've raised these issues in front of Department of Health people, they, you know, just refuse to accept that any errors or mistakes were made. And I think that's a very dangerous yes, mindset. Um, so. I, I would just add one more thing. Sorry, Alicia, you're trying to cut the cord. I can't. I have to say one more thing, which is smart libertarians, smart John, you know, sit down. Smart libertarians have come up with a name called state capacity libertarianism. Yes. The yes. smart libertarians have figured out that starving the beast and having a crappy government that doesn't work very well doesn't help anyone. So, yep. yeah, I agree. On that note, and uh, with uh, Denise's comment that says that uh, our government believes we are overgoverned, I think it's um, probably a good point. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you all very much. I think it's been quite interesting, and there's so much more than we could talk of. We could talk for yeah. hours about this. So thank you so much. 